Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here tonight in this beautiful event of Afrashat Chala. The Gemara speaks very highly about the mitzvah of Afrashat Chala for women as one of the three main mitzvot of the woman which also allows them when they have time to get to give birth that things will go smooth and with health and shalom with no complication is the mitzvah of afrashat chala this mitzvah is a very very lucky mitzvah because now all over the world it became very popular that many places they do afrashat chala all over and it brings a lot of secular women that are totally not religious and they come for, you know, for the event because it's very popular and that's the beginning of their journey back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Little by little they meet more religious girls and they take them to other events and few months later, Baruch Hashem, you find out that they already Shomer Shabbat and it's a beautiful thing. When I say that this mitzvah has a good mazal, I will explain what I meant. Some mitzvot in Judaism, the Gemara say, some mitzvot has mazal, some mitzvot does not have mazal. Chazal are telling us, akol talui b'mazal, afilu sefer Torah sheba echal. Everything, when we say mazal, when you translate it to English, the word is fortune, but it's not accurate. Mazal really in Hebrew means ashgacha, Hashem's decision. If Hashem wants you to have it or He wants you not to have it. So in the end, that's what we call mazal. It's true that when you're born, there are 12 months of the year and there are 12 mazalot. And in every day of the month is a different, different effect on your mazal. And in every hour of the day there is a different effect on your mazal. Meaning if you are born in a, in a, in a month of let's say around April, around um, Pesach, before Pesach, Nisan, you mazal tale, Aries. But the mazal tale that goes for the entire month of Nisan, Every day is a different mazal. Among the entire month, every day makes a difference. Some days are more, better than others. And every day has 24 hours, and every hour has a different mazal than the other. And every hour has 60 minutes, and every minute has a different mazal than the other. Not all 60 minutes are equal. And every minute has 60 seconds, and every second has a different mazal than the other. That's why in Judaism, you're not allowed to induce delivery, the labor. You have to let it come natural because you will know exactly what Hashem wanted. That the baby will be born in this day, at that hour, at that minute, and at that second. Sometimes, it could be a life risk. Let's say if the wife doesn't give birth, if they don't induce her, chas shalom, it can create problems to the baby or to her. When it's pikuach nefesh, we're not thinking about mazal. First, we're thinking about saving life. It comes before everything. But usually, when doctors want to induce the woman, it's not because of she's, in, she's in danger, because they want to go home early. They don't want to stay until 3 a.m. So now it's 11, they know it may take another four hours, they don't want to hang around, right? So they induce it, give birth, and Hashem irachem. But it can affect the mazal of a person. Also, when chaz v'shalom lo alenu, when a person passes away, every hour, every minute, every second, it's precisely calculated by Hashem. That's why you're not allowed to shorten the life of a sick person even by a second. And if somebody does it, it's considered full murder. In the time of Bet HaMikdash, when they had Sanhedrin, if an old man was 120 years old, and today it's the last day of his life, he lived a full life, and he can barely breathe, 
meaning any minute he will pass, and someone choked him because he wanted to go home, choked him two minutes before, that's 100% murder. He cannot say, ah, oh, anyway he would die in two minutes. He was already dead, what? You cannot shorten the life of a person even by a second. One second earlier, it's murder. You may ask, it's not fair. If somebody kills someone 20 years old, lo alenu, he had another seven years to live. If somebody took two seconds or two minutes of someone's life, that's not compared to seven years of life. It's not fair. The answer is because a life, a, a minute of life, can gain a person eternity. So the value of one minute of life cannot be even evaluated. There's no end to how much a person can earn in one minute. Why? It's enough that a person repent before he passes and speaks to Hashem while he's up, well, basically 99% dead already, even in his mind, that he regret all the bad things that he did in his life, that's already affecting his judgment completely. So if you avoided that minute from him, or you were able to take such a risk to shorten his life by a minute or two, that's a very serious problem. Going back to what we said. So everyone was born in a mazal according to the relationship between the earth and the sun and the moon, the solar system. You know, the movement of the earth, as you know, the earth is rotating around itself in a 1700 kilometer per hour speed. And it's remained the same thing from the minute Hashem created the world. It never ever was one second behind. That's why when you buy a Swiss watch and you pay $100,000, the only reason it costs so much money is because you count on Hashem that the system will be reliable. But for instance, if one time the earth will go slow or will go too fast, the watch has no value. Because anyway, you cannot tell the accurate time. What good is that? But Baruch Hashem, everything is moving precisely. One year it takes 365 days to go around the sun. And every 24 hours it finishes a complete circle. And while the earth is moving, the moon is circulating the earth and moving together with the earth around the sun. And at the second that you're born is exactly when Hashem wanted you to come to the world. And it also has a lot to do with the Shiduchim. That when your soulmate is also born according to the calculation of Hashem. Meaning if Hashem wants the man to be two years older than the girl, and he set up to Neshamot, he set it up in such a timing that it's all according to his plan. Now it's very interesting, now when we understand how this whole system works, there is one more thing to learn. It's called reincarnations, Gilgulim. Every one of you here sitting here tonight was already in a world before in a different body. Some of you were women. Some of you were men. Some of you could be a regular man. Some of you could have been a Kohen. Some of you could have been a Levi. Some of you could have been white. Some of you could have been dark. There are many, many possibilities. You can have been in every country in the world. Jews coming back as Jews. Gentiles coming back as Gentiles. With one exception to the rule, which I, rem which I prefer not to mention. There is one punishment that some ladies get, but let's not get into it now in a special happy night like tonight. But you should know, in general, almost always, everyone who passed as a Jew comes back as a Jew. Some goyim, they come back to the world and they feel that they have a Jewish heart. I'm sure I'm a Jew, I'm not connected to anything that is not Jewish, from a very young age. I can swear I'm Jewish. You cannot be Jewish, your mother is not Jewish. Why is it with this Goim? Because this Goim, when Hashem gave us the Torah in Mount Sinai, He actually went to every nation and offered them the Torah and they made a vote. And the majority of each nation of the Goim voted against receiving the Torah. They asked a lot of questions. What's in it? You should not kill. Not for us. You should not steal. Not for us. 
You should not have any other God but me, not for us. So what happened? Many of the Goim over there did want to accept the Torah, but they were the minority. So why they should be punished? Because the majority voted against receiving the Torah. So the Zohar, the Kabbalah, the Holy Zohar says that every Goy or Goya that wanted to accept the Torah and because they could not accept the Torah because of the vote, Hashem sent them back in reincarnation to be able to convert. So they are in a Jewish area or they go to school with Jewish friends or they get to see some Jewish videos on YouTube by rabbis or to collect a CD somewhere when they went and put it in and all of a sudden discover Judaism. So every one of them has an opportunity. There's one uh, former Goy from Mexico. He was a baseball player. Baseball player. One t I once gave him a ride an hour from Monsi to uh, Queens and he told me the whole story. He told me, I'm in a family of ten, ten, uh, ten sons, nine sons and one, do one daughter. We lived in Mexico. Our parents told us, always search for the truth. But we were Christians. I was a very good baseball player. They offered me to come to New York to join a baseball team, professional baseball teams. They have to, to test me in training. Maybe they will hire me. If they will, I will be a very rich man because they make millions. When I came with the bus, accidentally I took the wrong bus and I arrived to Boro Park. And it was Friday evening, six-ish. I arrived, instead of to come to the stadium in Queens or to where he was supposed to go, he arrived to Boro Park, Brooklyn. I came out, remember, he's a Mexican guy. He walks around and he sees thousands of people dressed the same. Everyone has a beard, black hat, all these strings coming out of their pants. And he looked around and he said, where am I? Am I alive? Am I on this planet? And he went to one of the people, excuse me, who are you people? Why everyone does the same like? So this is a Jewish area. And I always read about the Jews in the, what they call the New Testament and all the stories of the Torah. I was fascinated. So I asked him, where is everyone walking now? He said, we're going to the synagogue to accept the Sabbath. <laughs> Can I come? Imagine this Hasid. <laughs> what does he want from me? This Mexican now. Say, so can I come? He said, yeah, you can come. You can stand over here and watch. He came over there. He saw the Ashkenazim singing. That's the moment that changed his life. He forgot about the baseball. He, started, he asked him after that, can I come for the meal? The guy could not believe how this guy is so thirsty to hear Torah. He want to ask question. He said, okay, come. He took him in. From then on, he started to go to Jewish events until he ended up in yeshiva in Monsi. Learned Hebrew fluently and became a sofer that, that writes Sifre Torah, Tfilin, and Mezuzot. And then became a rabbi that gives speeches and make Baalei Tshuva. All of that because Hashem made him take the wrong bus and landed in Boro Park. If he would land in a baseball place, he would probably become a famous baseball player, but die as an idol worshiper. So you see that all the goyim that wanted to become Jewish, Hashem gave them a chance. By the way, he told me that all his brothers converted to Judaism, except his sister. What his sister is doing? She's a nun in a church. So all the kids were spiritual. They were looking. The boys were meant to become Jewish and this girl went to her direction. Going back to what I started, in reincarnation, when you come to the world, they said that your shiduch is announced already. Before you were even created, Hashem already announced who is going to marry who. But a person can lose his shiduch by his behaving. For instance, Hashem announced Yosef to Miriam. Yosef, son of David, to Miriam, daughter of Shimon. 
If one of the two, Yosef and Miriam, become righteous, and the other one, Chas Shalom, does not want to become righteous, after X amount of time, Hashem sees that the Shidduch does not match. The guy is learning Torah, is religious, and this girl is very not modest. She doesn't keep mitzvot. He cannot put them together. So at one point, Hashem break the announcement, break the Shidduch, take the boy away from this girl, and find him another Shidduch, and find her another Shidduch, someone like her, not religious, don't care about Hashem, don't care about anything. Like they say in Hebrew, min matza et mino. Kind found his own kind, religious to religious, non-religious to non-religious. But I want to tell you a secret. The Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 2, meaning which the first page, the Gemara says, Mezavgim lo la'adam zivug lefi ma'asav. A person get a shiduch according to his actions. Tznu'a la tzadik, purutza la rasha. The Gemara say, a modest woman to the righteous man, a non-modest woman to the wicked man. The first question we have to ask, wait a minute. By the man, the Torah say righteous and wicked. By the women, the Torah do not say righteous and wicked. Modest or the opposite of modest. Prutza, parutz, mean like you broke the fence. There is a fence who gathered you um, within the law and you broke the fence and went out of the boundaries of the Torah. That's called parutz or prutza. Someone that does not care about the divine law. I do it my way. I do whatever I want. I don't care about Shabbat. I don't care about modesty. So there are all kinds of pritzuyot. There's parutz be'arayot. Parutz be'choser tzniyot. Parutz be'chilul Shabbat. Parutz be'machalot asurot. Things that are not allowed to eat. When the Gemara generally say prutza, it means in modesty. Meaning she's not, she doesn't care how she dress. And she doesn't care how she behave. So the Gemara say, righteous with a modest woman, wicked with prutza. Everybody asks, wait a minute, why by the women there's no righteous and wicked? There's only modest or not modest? The answer is yes. Because the most important thing in the life of a Jewish woman is modesty. If the Jewish woman is modest, she already passed her test. If she keeps Shabbat and she dress modest and behave modest, she already have 90% of her test in her pocket. Two things, Shabbat and modesty. That's already 90%. Everything else combined, 10%. Shabbat, if she keeps Shabbat fully and she always dress modest and behave modest, she's already a very righteous woman. Now she has to make brachot and eat kosher and do a frashat challah. All of that is important. But she has those two, basically she has almost everything. She doesn't have those two, she basically have nothing. Why? Because the main purpose of a woman in the world is to be modest. Every Gdolei Israel say the same thing. They ask the Chazonish. By a Jewish man, the Torah say, Limut Torah keneged kulam. If you learn Torah, it's the highest level. What about the women? He answer by the women is modesty. If the woman is modest, she's in a very high level. And if she's not, Hashem irachem. So now we understand, Rabotai, that it's very important that a woman will stick to those laws. The Gemara say three things is very important for, for the woman. What are they? Nida, Chala, all right, and Adlakat Aner, lighting the Nerot Shabbat, meaning accepting Shabbat. It's not only lighting candle. It means break, keeping Shabbat, but starting with lighting of the candles. So Shabbat, Nida, and Afrashat Chala. Afrashat Chala, like I said, <laughs> it's very, oh, it's working. Afrashat Chala, like I said, is a great tool today to attract people to come and to, yeah, it's a problem. 
and to come and to keep the rest of the mitzvot. So it's a great tool to do events like this, bringing people, and from that, Bezrat Hashem, they get to see other things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, like I said, we're going back to the mazal. The Torah says, "Akol talui b'mazal, afilu sefer Torah sheba echad." When you go to the synagogue on Shabbat, they open the ark of the shul with all the sifre Torah inside. Let's say they have nine. Usually, they have some places they have many. Like it's a whole room with shelves. There's many, many sifre Torah, like a shape of a chet, like these three tables. That's how it looks, and you have a lot of sifre Torah. Now they have to decide which Sefer Torah to take out. There are nine options, sometimes 10, 20, depend. Which Sefer Torah they're going to use today, it's also Taluy Bamazal. It's not random. It's also the decision of Hashem. Based on what Hashem makes the decision which Sefer Torah to use, based on who donated it. Who does Hashem want to give a reward? Reuven gave Sefer Torah and Shimon. Maybe Shimon doesn't have the same merit like Reuven. So Hashem makes the Sefer Torah of Reuven going to be used much more than Shimon. Or it also depends on a level on the Sefer Torah. One was trying to save money, so he got a very low level. The other one was very generous, saying, make the best. I pay double, no problem. When a person does with generosity and all the, from his heart, with devotion, L'Shem Shamayim, for the sake of heaven, the mitzvah has mazal, the mitzvah has blessing. So let me explain to you what does it mean some mitzvot has mazal and some mitzvot do not have mazal. Some mitzvot, for some reason, there's always reasons, but for some reason, they are very lucky. Like, mitzvah of mezuzah. Almost every Jew in the world put mezuzot in his house. Almost everybody, more than 99%. Even people that are totally not religious, even reform people, even conservative, secular people, mechalelei Shabbat, people that marry to non-Jews, People that are living in a worse abomination, you come to the house, they have mezuzot. That's mitzvah that has mazal. Mitzvah of tefillin. Many, many secular people put tefillin. But no secular people keep Shabbat. Let me explain. If a person become religious, let's say he was not religious, he watched Torah and Science, or The Purpose of Life, or Life After Death, or the film about Shabbat, or any other thing who got him inspired, and he began to put tefillin. His friends, they saw him with the tefillin. They said, what, you're becoming religious? You become Baal Tshuva? He said, no, don't exaggerate. I only put tefillin. Stop. One day he goes with friends to the restaurant, everybody eats, he doesn't eat. Why you don't eat? It's not kosher. Since when you care about kosher? I watch, I eat only kosher. What, you becoming a Baal Tshuva? You becoming religious? No, I only eat kosher, what's the big deal? Let's say he didn't have mezuzot, and he went to the store to buy mezuzot. His friends say, what, you're becoming religious? He said, what, I have to be religious to put mezuzah in my house? Let's say he has a boy, and he actually wants to do Brit Milah in a synagogue. Nobody would suspect him that he became religious. But there is one mitzvah that when a person begins to keep it, if they ask him, you became religious, he cannot say no. Everybody knows he became religious. Which one? Shabbat. If he becomes Shomer Shabbat, he doesn't drive anymore, doesn't turn on the TV, no electronic, no, no fire. People come and say to him, what, you're becoming religious? No, I'm totally secular, I'm an atheist. So why are you keeping Shabbat? Is no answer. 
Everything else, he can say, אני חילוני מניח תפילין. אני חילוני עושה ברית מילה. I'm חילוני eating מצה עם פסח. חילוני פוט מזוזה. חילוני even come to שיעור תורה. Perfectly fine. But you cannot say, אני חילוני שומר שבת. Why? Once you became שומר שבת, you on the way to become religious. That's nobody can deny it. We see from here, that Shabbat is the foundation of Judaism and that's why Hashem gave Shabbat before He gave the Torah as a separate Torah Shabbat is a Torah by itself Shabbat is a Torah by itself and if you keep Shabbat you have the holiness of life and blessing Shabbat is Mekora Bracha the source of blessing a person doesn't keep even whatever he does he will never have the divine blessing why? because he go against the creator of the world It's just a matter of time until one day you realize that you messed up your entire life. So Rabotai, some mitzvot does not have mazal. Let me give you an example. Brit Mila, it mitzvah that has mazal. Almost everyone does Brit Mila, but Brit Mila, it's against human logic. Because if you speak to some Jew that is totally, totally secular, he was born in Siberia, he lives now in Brighton Beach, He doesn't know anything about Torah. He had a boy now. He does Brit Milah. He calls the rabbi, can you do Brit Milah for me? This is mitzvah that has mazal. People that say, I don't believe in God, they do Brit Milah to the boys. Even the most wicked people in the Israeli government that fight the Torah every day of their life and try to destroy the yeshivot and try to destroy Shabbat and try to destroy the religion, when they have a baby, They put yamaka on and they do brit milah. Nobody can understand that. What person that doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in the Torah is willing to take a baby and cut a piece from his body. If he would cut the ear, he would go to jail for 20 years, attempted murder, right? If you cut the ear of a baby, they right away will say, you're crazy. What's the difference between the ear and brit milah? Isn't it the same? But with brit milah, almost everyone does it and almost everybody doesn't understand the logic of it because it's all chilonim they don't know but they do it this is mitzvah with mazal Shabbat mitzvah without mazal close to 80% of the Jews in the world do not keep Shabbat and none of them knows what they're doing if they knew what Shabbat is for a billion dollar they would not agree one time to break Shabbat for a billion dollar They're just not aware of how horrible is their crime. Nobody ever taught them. They don't know the punishment in the Torah. They, know what, they don't know what's going to happen to them in Olam Abba. If they know, immediately they become Shomre Shabbat. They'll never dare to break it once. That's mitzvah without mazal. Taharat mishpacha. Couple get married. Woman has to go to the mikveh. Most Jews do not even know what it is. Go to Israel. Ask thousand women on the street. You know, you keep tarat mishpacha, ma ze, what is it? You know, nida, what's nida? Mikveh, what's mikveh? They don't know anything. This is a, such an important mitzvah with such a horrible punishment and almost nobody knows what it is. Mitzvah without mazal. So we see Rabotai, some mitzvot has mazal that most people are aware of them and keep them. Even if they're not religious, some mitzvot do not have mazal. Many people have no idea what it is. Modesty for women. This mitzvah had mazal until a hundred years ago. You would never find one woman in the world that walk in the street with pants, or short sleeves, or anything open in the front or in the back, or anything attached to their body. I put one time on my Facebook page a picture from the beach in South Carolina in the year 1900. South Carolina, Meridal Beach, it's all Goim. All the women there in the beach were all non-Jewish. You had to see how they were dressed, like wedding gowns. The size of each dress was maybe five, six feet wide. Everything was covered head to toe. Not only the whole body was covered, They had a hat covering the hair, the goyot, full cover, and a net coming from the hat, covering the face, and an umbrella, that in case one mothers would try to look, 
she will hide herself with the umbrella. Now you may ask, who wants to go to the beach with such a gown? If you want to go swim, how are you going to swim? You want a bathing suit. A bathing suit is not modest. The answer is they made them rooms inside the water with the door. You open the door, you go inside, you take off, you hang everything there, you swim as much as you want, nobody sees you, you get dressed and you come out. This was the world everywhere. Jews, non-Jews, Muslim, Christian, everyone. Today is the exact opposite. For every million women in the world, maybe one is modest. Look at the streets, some Muslim woman or some extra Christian and mainly Orthodox Jews. That's it. Mitzvah that used to be with mazal, now it doesn't have any mazal. The generation became a zoo. People forgot that they are people. They walk in the street, they never get dressed, they don't care what, who, say, who looks at them. No more modesty. The problem is that this mitzvah, for instance, ruins people's life. How many marriages were broken because the woman is not modest? You cannot count how many. And today with the social media that they put pictures online and everybody looks at it and people begin to send compliment. A mother of a children behave like this. Do you think Hashem would agree with such lifestyle? What kind of blessing the wedding would have? Nothing. Zero blessing. So many times people do bad things, but not because they're evil. Not because they want to go against God. They're just not aware of what they're doing. They're not aware. They, they were born into this reality. You walk here in the streets of Queens or Manhattan or Brooklyn. You look at everyone, how they behave and dress. And it became a way of life. Now to talk about TV and movies and magazines and internet, which completely destroyed the life. Before I finish, I would like just to conclude. I see Baruch Hashem, some of the women here are married and some of them are still single. I want to start with the single girls. Your life is in front of you, ahead of you. You're going to make soon a very important choice in your life. What would it be? Who are you going to marry? Now I have 27 years of experience. 27 years is a lot. Day and night around the clock. I cannot count how many thousands of people I already advise in these subjects. It always works the same. If you would like to be in a successful relationship with great kids, with holiness in the house, you have to know. You yourself must work on your modesty, on Shabbat, and fixing your midot. Ego, pride, anger, laziness, all these things. If you fix your midot and you keep Shabbat and you are modest, you're going to get a very good guy. When they suggest to you a guy, the first thing you have to check, if you like how he looks, first of all, do you like, yeah, 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 that's the first thing you check before we talk about religion. Do you like him as a man? If yes, let's move to the next question. Does he keep mitzvot? Does he learn Torah? Does he have good personality? Is he going to, you know, to pray to in a minyan every day? Is his family good? What kind of living he's going to have? All of that is important. If the man is the most righteous man in the world and you don't like how he looks and you don't have any chemistry with him or you're not allowed to marry him. Same thing for a man with a woman. Every Gdola Dor say, Metziat Chen, number one thing. First, do you like how he looks? Let me show you someone in a wedding. Tall, short, heavy, skinny, with hair, without hair. Everyone has a different taste. Some women don't care so much about the look. Some women do care. Some women care about weight, some don't. Some women care about height. Everybody has a different taste, different mentality. First condition, you like how he looks. After that, is he connected to Torah every day? If you don't want someone that learn full day, that will be an avrech, at least make sure is a person that make time every day to learn Torah. Men that learn Torah are much better than men that do not learn Torah. They have better midot, less anger, more devotion, 
waking up in the morning in the right time, and they're going to be better husbands and better fathers, and control themselves. They won't act like animals. Why? Because the Torah killed the Yetzer Hara. If he doesn't learn Torah, expect the worst you can imagine. What? From experience, I tell you. You're not going to have any good surprise. Why? That's the way Hashem made the world. You learn Torah, you have boundaries. You have discipline. You don't learn Torah, even if you used to learn Torah. You stop, three months later, you can reach, to, you can r arrive to a level of animal. The way you talk, the way you dress, the way you behave, the words that you say, the abuse, putting down people. You don't want someone like that. Better to be single than to be married to an animal. Doesn't matter that he's rich, doesn't matter that he has a car and he's going to buy you a house and two maids. You're going to be a miserable woman in a bar, in a cage. The cage made from gold, but it's still a cage. You have to be very, very careful. I'm telling you from experience. If he learns Torah, there is something to talk about. Of course, keeping Shabbat, eating kosher, and have good personality. But remember, if you want to get a guy like this, you have to first fix who you are. And everybody needs to fix himself. No matter how righteous you are, every day it's a job to improve our personality. The anger, the jealousy, devotion, prayers, clean, keeping the mind clean. There's so many tests in life. If you do not know the purpose of life, how are you going to succeed in life? If you don't know why Hashem put you in this world, how are you going to succeed? If you don't know how important Shabbat and modesty is, what chance you have to do the right thing in the eyes of Hashem? You don't even know what it is. You don't know how upset you make Hashem. You have to know, Rabotai, these things are critical. And also the mitzvah of Nida, Hashem with his brilliance, he designed it that every month, a man can be with his wife approximately 17, 18 days and the rest is break until the next cycle. It's almost two-thirds allowed, one-third time out. Why is it? Very simple. Let's say a person love to go to a restaurant and eat a specific steak. Crazy about it. Addicted to that steak. So every night he eats dinner in that restaurant. Already 17 days in a row he eats the steak. What happened? Every day he enjoys a little bit less. The steak is the same steak. Delicious, number one in the world. But after 17 days in a row, as great as it is, the desire goes down. So they say to him, take two weeks off, take 12 days off, don't come to the restaurant, come back in 12 days. By the time he come back after 12 days, he can wait online. Wait, wait, sir, we don't have a table. No, no, why? You see other people eating, is on fire. Why? That's the way Hashem made the world. Every physical pleasure, if you do too much of it, you get tired of it. So you need on and off. So what did Hashem say? To put a man and a woman 60 years together in the same room, it's an impossible mission. Why? They get tired of each other very, very shortly after. That's it. In the beginning, it's all exciting. After six months, they got used to each other. No more excitement. So what will I do to keep the excitement? I will make such a mitzvah of nida. On and off. On and off. That's it. So now, if a woman doesn't understand it, and the man doesn't understand it, how long the marriage will be good? Maximum few months. But on the other hand, if they keep this mitzvah, even after 30 years, it's still going to be good. There's always some exception to the rules, I'm not saying no, but you don't want to count on a miracle. And I will finish with one story about Nida for you to understand what it means. 25, 25 to 30 years ago in Israel, they had a trial. The trial of a man that murdered a very old lady. How did he murder the lady? He was trying to grab a gold necklace from her neck. And because the necklace was very strong, he, he didn't rip. He was pulling and pulling, and it wasn't rip. And she fell on her face, and a few hours later she died. That's the end of the story. When they went to the court, the mother of the murderer was sitting in the, in the audience, 
and she was waiting for her son's trial to start in the court of Tel Aviv. When the judge announced the name of the woman that was killed, the mother of the man screamed in a courtroom and fainted. They put some water on her face, wake them, woke her up. The judge asked her, we didn't even start the trial. Why all of a sudden is screaming and fainting? When I read the name of the woman, he started to scream. Did you know her? She said to the judge, yes, I did. Can I tell you a story why I, why I fainted? My son, as you can see, is 21 years old. 22 years ago, it was Friday evening. My husband told me, you have to go to the mikveh. Soon they're gonna close the mikveh and you're not gonna be able to go. I was busy with baking and cooking. I said to him, 10 more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes. By the time I went to the mikveh, the balanit, the woman who is in charge, was closing the gate. I said to her, please, I'm begging you, let me in. Wait another 10, 15 minutes. She said, I'm sorry, it's almost Shabbat. Why are you coming so late? She said to her, believe me, I couldn't come earlier. She said, come back tomorrow night. What's the big deal? You won't be with your husband tonight. So she said, no, no, my husband is a very angry man. He's going to go crazy if he finds out that I missed the tvila. Because he told me ten times to go and I kept telling him I have time, I have time. He's going to kill me, please. Let me in. No, I'm sorry, everyone comes in the last minute. I also have life. She locked and left. When she came back home, she has an angry wolf at home. No, Tavalt? Yeah, yeah, Tavalti. She was afraid of him. That night she conceived and nine months later she gave birth to a boy who 21 years later walked in the street from thousands of people. There was an old lady standing by the bus stop. He grabbed the necklace from her neck and accidentally killed her. Of course, there's no accident. And in the courtroom, she found out that her son that was conceived that night killed the balanit from the mikveh of 21 years ago. 21 years. The one that came to the world with impurity, without nida. 21 years ago, Hashem sent him to steal the necklace from this woman and Hashem made the necklace not... Usually when you pull the necklace, it's gonna rip. He tried a few times, it wasn't ripping. And she fell on her face and died. Everything in the world has Din and Dayan. On the other hand, that was a negative story of Ashgacha of Hashem. I'll tell you a positive story, which finish with positive. A few years ago, I used to give lectures here in a kindergarten of children. At night, the place is empty. So the woman, the, the daughter of the, of the owner of the, of the place, she organized the lecture to her friends. And there was one girl, 20 years old, and she came to me after the lecture, and she said, you are from Monsi. Can you maybe find me a guy from the yeshiva? I want someone to sit and learn, someone serious. I say to her, write down your information, and if I have someone, I let you know the name of your rabbi, whatever. Three months later, I went back to the same place. All the friends of the woman were there, except that red-haired girl. You couldn't miss her. Her head was red like a tomato. Very reddish. So I say to her, all your friends came, but the, the, the Jinjit never came. She said, oh, Baruch Hashem, she just got married. She has Sheva Brachot. I said, wow, it's beautiful. She just got married only three months after we spoke. She found someone. Then she said, you want to know how she got married? How you get married? You meet someone, you go on dates, you like each other, and you get married. What does it mean how she got married? I got curious. And anyway, I had five more minutes. I was connecting my laptop, my projector. I had a few minutes. So I said, yes, I want to hear how she got married. After she spoke to you that you should look for her for Shiduch, she went to a library. She was sitting with Jewish books, doing some articles. And one girl, totally not modest, secular completely, Jewish girl, came to her. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, how are you? 
I see that you're very religious, I've been looking at you and this. I think I have a good shidduch for you. What kind of shidduch would come to a very religious girl from a very not religious girl? Actually, it's not such a good idea. What kind of a guy she's going to find her? She's not religious. She said to her, you know, I'm very religious. I want a guy that sits and learns Torah all his life. She said, perfect. I have the right guy for you, and he likes red hair. Who? My brother. Hashem <laughs> Yerachem. If the way she dressed, what kind of a brother she had. No, no, don't get the wrong impression. Don't look at me. I'm not religious. But my brother is a real bad tshuva. He went to Monsi, he was in yeshiva, and he only wanted really religious mother's girl. And I have a very good feeling that you and him is a good match. Oh, if that's the case, here is my rabbi telephone number. Please have his rabbi contact my rabbi and set it up. Everything looked like a good match. Now, one thing I want to tell you about this girl, She's a friend of the woman who organized the shiur since they were kids, four or five years old. Her parents came from Russia when she was a little girl. They could not afford to send her to yeshiva. They were very poor. And someone told them there is an organization that collects money from Russian wealthy people and put poor kids in yeshivot. Go and make an application. For sure they'll approve you. And that's the way it was. They went over there, they took their information, they saw they just came, they don't have money. They found them a sponsor, a rich Russian man from Mill Basin, Brooklyn, lives by the water in a nice house, and he's totally secular. He's not even religious. He sent his own kids to public school. But he felt bad for that religious girl, and he said, how, how much it is? And they told him a few hundred dollars every month. So he decided to sponsor that girl for 16 years. He was paying her tuition to yeshiva, not knowing, he knew about her name, but he didn't know how she looks, and you know, he didn't know that many details. After this girl went to the house to meet the parents of their future, the in-laws, the future in-laws, the rabbis came, everybody came, you know how they do the lechaim. In that meeting that night, they found out that the boy is the son of the man that paid the girl's tuition for 16 years. Seven billion people in the world. This red-haired girl came to America without a penny. They found her a man that doesn't know who she is, not religious. He sponsored her, Hashem helped him. He sent his son to become religious, sent him to yeshiva, met the girls through the sister in a public place, and in the end he thought, oh, I'm such a tzaddik, I'm paying for yeshiva of a girl that I don't even know for 16 years. How many religious people willing to do such thing? I'm not less than them, look. And Hashem said, hey, relax. You're not doing favors to anyone. There's no such thing doing favors to someone. You always do favors to yourself. You prepared your son's wife in your own hands. Now remember, when the people from the organization came to him and asked him to sponsor a girl, most men would say, no, I'm not religious. I'm sending my own kids to public school. How should I pay tuition to someone I don't even know? Ask me for Sefer Torah, ask me for Tfilin, something that I can relate to. Ah, the yeshiva now. If he would say no, his son will not become religious, and this girl probably would end up in public school. If they meet or not, I don't know, because maybe Hashem wanted them to meet either way, but what kind of marriage they would have? What kind of marriage? To look at the, what's going on today in the world. But the whole thing got some, such a blessing because of a decision of this man. He prepared his own daughter-in-law, and she's such a tzaddika, this girl, you have to see. Right away I saw, she said, I want the guy that learned Torah, I don't care about money, I don't care about anything. What did Hashem do? Send her a multi-millionaire. Live like a queen now. Why? Everything in his life is midah keneged midah. 
measure for measure, for good and for bad. I would like to thank you very much, and Bezrat Hashem, hope I woke you up to get inspired. If you want to hear more lectures in any topic you want, please go to my website, divineinformation.com, or download my app, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. It's blue with the star David. We have thousands of lectures there, in English, in Hebrew, some in Spanish, in Russian. Any topic you can think of, you have it right there. Thank you. I want to bless everyone. Thank you very much for organizing it and inviting me. Bezrat Hashem, I want to bless all the single girls to have good shiduchim and good mazal and great families and all the married ones to have shalom bayit, parnasa, great kids and nachat ma'iladim. Thank you very much and all the best.